When Phoenix Luna was 20 years old, he was every girl's dream. They were lining up to date him and some of them even started to go crazy with obsession. One morning, he awoke to a knife plunged into his stomach by a stalker fan who wanted to be with him forever, even if that meant both of them had to die. As Phoenix was left fighting for his life, his attacker was going viral on social media, gaining her own adoring fan base of people believing that she was just too beautiful to be a murderer. Today, we're talking about the insane case of Yuka Takayoka and Phoenix Luna. Before we get into the story, I just want to thank Case to Buy for sponsoring this video. They've outdone themselves again. Let me show you their new Impact Ring Stand cases. It's basically an upgrade of the Impact cases that we've known and loved for years, but now the camera ring doubles up as a kickstand. Guys, it's revolutionary. <laughs> Gone are the days of having to hold up your phone while you're watching something. You can just set it down. I use this all the time. I used it the other day when I was on the plane. I use it while I'm doing my makeup. I just like set up my video next to it. I watch a lot of true crime videos while I'm getting ready and it makes it so much easier to follow along when I can just like have it set up next to my mirror and just keep flicking my eyes over whenever a picture pops up. It's perfect for so many different things like following on with a recipe when you're cooking or something or even when you're FaceTiming people to be able to just set it down and have free hands. If you do workout videos, I imagine this would be perfect for that. I mean, I personally <laughs> don't be doing that, but whatever. Like I said, it's the same impact case that we know and love and all of the benefits of the impact case still stand with this. It's drop tested from 6.6 .6 feet. So it's super, super protective and they're still made of 65% recycled and plant-based materials, which is amazing. They also have hundreds of cute prints for you to choose from. You can customize them as well. So you can still have your name on these. They're MagSafe compatible as well. So wireless charging is still good on these. I love doing things hands-free. I'm so excited about these new cases. So if you want to pick yourself up one of the snazzy new impact ring stand cases, they're available for the new iPhone 15s as well. So if you're getting the new phone, make sure you're protecting it. As always, Casetify are very kindly giving you guys a discount. When you go to casetify.com forward slash Eleanor, there will be 15% off automatically applied at checkout for you. Yeah. Thanks again so much to Casetify for sponsoring this video. Love you guys. Now, one last thing before I get into the case, I just want to give my usual disclaimer that I mean absolutely no disrespect to anyone that I talk about in this video. Everything that I'm about to say is publicly available information that myself and my team have found online and compiled into this one video. This video will cover especially sensitive topics, including but not limited to stalking and obsessive behaviors, child abuse and neglect, mention of suicide and suicidal ideation. So if any of that feels too triggering or too intense for you, then I would recommend that you click out of this video now. Hopefully I'll get to see you some other time with a different video, but until then, look after yourself. While we make every effort to fact check our sources and make sure that all of the information in this video is correct, no action should be taken in reliance upon the information in this video. And I wanna take this opportunity to quickly remind you that these are real people's lives. So please keep your comments kind and respectful. All opinions stated in this video are mine and mine alone. And with that being said, let's get into the case. So today's case takes place in Tokyo, Japan in May, 2019, 2019. Don't know why I said it like that. Tokyo is known for its vibrant nightlife and where this case took place was actually one of the liveliest parts of it, a place named Shinjuku. 20 year old Phoenix Luna worked as a host in one of the host clubs in Tokyo and he was very popular among both customers and his coworkers. He had a very promising career ahead of him. But such success was very new to Phoenix because he hadn't had the easiest life. Things didn't come easily to him. He'd had to work very, very hard for every opportunity that he'd ever had. He was born just north of Tokyo in a place called Tochigi, where he lived with his parents and his seven siblings, seven siblings, for the first few years of his life. But when Phoenix was still very young, his parents separated and it was a very nasty separation. I don't know the details, but for whatever reason, they decided to put all seven of their children into care. From that point on, Phoenix never saw his parents again. He was around six years old when he was put into care and I believe a lot of the siblings were split up. So it wasn't just like he never saw his parents again, he never saw some of his brothers and sisters ever again. And if that wasn't bad enough, the institution that he was put into was also 
hell on earth. I mean, it was okay to give him his basic needs met. You know, he had a roof over his head. He had food on the table. He had a bed to sleep in. But that was about it. They don't have parental figures in these homes. They don't have love or care or attention. They're not really raised. They're just surviving. And I imagine from the age of six, that is hard to not have any kind of parental figure. No guidance in life, really. Just a bunch of other lost kids all trying to make it together. Phoenix had very little privacy in the house that he was in. And I mean, a lot of these institutions in Japan are very populated. There are a lot of children that need to be put into these care homes. So they're often sharing bedrooms with each other. There's like five kids to a room. It's, you know, it's really not a nice experience. Not only were these children left without emotional support, without parental figures, but in a lot of cases, the, the caregivers that they did have in these houses could be abusive or neglectful towards these children. Children could stay in these institutions until they finished high school and then they would have to move out and, you know, survive on their own. But kids could leave as young as 15 years old if they completed junior high. And after that point, if they really did want to leave these homes, then they could go out and try and make it alone. And Phoenix Luna was one of those kids. He wanted out of this home as soon as he possibly could. So when he completed junior high, 15 years old, he was out of there. He'd been in that institution for 10 years. And when he left, he actually had a job lined up in construction, but he really struggled both to provide for himself with this job and also to just integrate into a normal life, integrate into society at large. He worked this construction job for a couple of years, but eventually had to leave for personal reasons. I don't know what those reasons were, but this left him with no job, no money, nowhere to live. He became homeless. He would stay over at friends' houses or in like cheap hostels, or sometimes he would even just go into like 24 hour cafes and, and just have naps and just try to survive without a bed. And he was caught in a catch-22 because when you don't have a job and you don't have a house, finding a job becomes so much harder because you don't have an address. So then these potential jobs, these places that you're applying can't contact you very easily. It's a very difficult cycle to end up in. Um, but Phoenix actually managed to find a way out of it when he applied for a job at a place called Club Fusion. This was a host club, and I'll tell you what a host club is in a second. But part of the nature of a host club is that they give dorms, dorm rooms, to their staff. So it's a place to live and a place to work. That would sort his money issue, his housing issue. He'd also have some community. He would have co-workers that he literally lived with as well. And luckily for Phoenix, he had one specific trait that made him perfect for this job at Club Fusion. He was pretty. Host clubs are known for their attractive and charismatic service staff. I mean, that's the whole, that's the whole point of a host club. I'll explain what one is because we don't have anything like them over here in the UK. I don't know about other countries, but this was quite new to me. I mean, I've heard of it happening, but we don't just be having these in London. As far as I'm aware, anyway. <laughs> to my knowledge, we don't have these. So host or hostess clubs are nightclubs and bars, primarily in Japan, they're very popular over there. And the customers go, usually after work, it's usually an evening thing since they're bars and clubs, but they do tend to be open like all day. And people will go to have a drink, socialize with their friends, and to converse, be entertained by these attractive young workers. It was actually hostess clubs that started first. They were aimed at men, staffed by young, beautiful women. Their main job is to look pretty and to have good, probably flirty conversation with the clients, fill their drinks, give them cigars, you know, like whatever. Just like cater to the men and be pretty while you're doing it. Hostesses work on commission, so they would encourage the men to buy more drinks. It encourages them to be flirtier with the men so that they like them and then they'll come back to see them. They can book to see specific hostesses. They would end up building a bit of a friendship relationship with certain members of staff. And in a lot of clubs, there would be like a ranking system of all the hostesses or the hosts in host clubs. So like the most popular hosts would be earning the most money, they're in demand the most, they're, you know, harder to book. And for a while, these clubs were just targeted at men, it was just women working them. But then they realized, actually, there's a market in this 
for women. Women would probably want something like this too. After a long day at work, all the girl bosses need to go and let off some steam and flirt with cute guys, hey. So that's when host clubs were invented, just like the one that Phoenix worked at. They were all young, beautiful men that catered to women. When Phoenix Luna first started hosting at Club Fusion, he was an immediate hit because he was pretty, he was. He was so popular, in fact, that within the first couple of months of him working there, he was already in the top five hosts of his club. He lived in the dorm that was provided, he was making friends with his co-workers and stuff, and for the first time in pretty much his whole entire life since a child, Phoenix had a sense of community, of, of family, of safety. The older hosts had like taken him under their wing, they were showing him the ropes, teaching him the tricks of the trade, and he just felt very safe and secure. He had a job that he was good at, they weren't gonna fire him because he was in the top five hosts. He had a place to sleep every night, guaranteed. He had money coming in every month. Everything was looking really good for Phoenix. He had a few regulars that would come to the club specifically to see him because they liked him so much. And one of these was a young hostess from a nearby hostess club. Her name was Yuka Takayoka. Phoenix and Yuka first met in October 2018 at Club Fusion. Yuka came in after her shift at her work and she saw Phoenix and she immediately just fell for him. She was actually a manager at her hostess club. So she was good at her job. She'd been in it for a while. She was a little bit older than Phoenix. She was 21, he was 20. Um, but when Phoenix met her, he remembered thinking that she seemed just like a good girl, like a good, sweet, kind woman. Yuka had had a bit of a troubled life herself. I don't know too many details, but what we do know is she ended up dropping out of university and that was when she became a hostess and she really enjoyed it. She started to progress. She was one of the best hostesses in her club. And as the weeks went by, Yuka kept dropping into Club Fusion specifically to see Phoenix. She'd met him and she thought he was the most beautiful host in that club. So she would pop by a lot and request him. By April 2019, so like a good half a year since they met, they ended up seeing each other most days. Most days Yuka would either drop in or they started seeing each other outside of the club, but we'll get back to that in a minute. Phoenix didn't mind. Phoenix actually quite liked Yuka. Like I said, she seemed like a nice, sweet girl to him and he was getting paid for it. <laughs> like it's literally his job. So he, there was, there was no complaints from him. Hosts always need to be polite and kind and cordial with their clients. But for Phoenix, Yuka made that easy. They got on quite well. They had a lot in common. They both liked anime. They both liked cosplay. So even though he was working, she was paying for his time. A lot of the time it didn't feel like that to them. And remember the kind of life that Phoenix had had, he wasn't used to people being kind and gentle and, and warm and caring about him, you know? So I think this is one of the things that really drew him in about Yuka. This was the first like very intimate relationship that he'd ever had relationship. It wasn't a relationship, but you know, like a relationship. Hosts and hostesses are usually warned by their clubs to not make relationships uh, spill out of the club. You know, keep contact purely professional. Don't be seeing clients outside of the club because then it also makes it tricky because then how can you tell them to pay for your time if you're going to be seeing them for free? But despite that rule, uh, Yuka and Phoenix just completely ignored it. They started seeing each other outside of the club. Now, we don't know if this was completely for free. Um, I think Yuka could have probably been paying Phoenix for time outside of the club. And I guess then the money wouldn't have had to have gone through his club. He would have just got it all straight cash in pocket. Cash in hand. It's cash in hand, isn't it? I just made that up, cash in pocket. Yeah, it's not entirely clear why they ended up breaking that rule or that guideline. Um, some people think money could have been a, a factor. Me being one of them. I'm one of those people that thinks that. But regardless of whether it was paid or not, the two of them had a nice time together. They would go to cat cafes, they would watch movies together, watch anime together. And then after eight months of seeing each other, being friends with each other, Yuka put an exclusive reservation on Phoenix Luna at Club Fusion. So that meant he wasn't allowed to host for any other women other than Yuka. Now, I don't know the exact rules of this. I don't know if that meant that if she wasn't in the club, he wasn't working. I don't think that's what it meant. I think it was basically whenever she was in the club, he had to be dedicated to her. But if she wasn't there, he could work 
with other clients, you know? But regardless, she'd like reserved all of his time slots, every single one of his time slots, which we've worked out, she could have spent around eight thousand pounds on that eight thousand pounds to reserve this man just what because you fancy him so much she was essentially trying to block him from seeing slash flirting with other women i think because she was really starting to catch feelings she felt like they were boyfriend and girlfriend i mean they kind of acted like it they saw each other as much as a boyfriend and girlfriend would but i think yuka forgot that she was paying for his time. And it started to make her very jealous that he would be flirting with other women at work. Like it's literally his job to make other women feel special. But anyway, at this point, remember the uh, club ranking system and Phoenix was always in the top five. But now that Yuka had bought out all of his spots, Phoenix shot up to number one. He was number one. This was his first month on the top spot, which is actually kind of crazy considering he was a pretty new host. He hadn't even been working there a full year at this point. And the top spot in those clubs are usually reserved for like the legends, the ones that have been working there for years and years. They're practically like famous among their clients. And here comes this guy who's been working here for less than a year. This one girl spends 8,000 pounds on all of his slots and he shoots up to number one. Phoenix was very grateful to Yuka for doing this because it meant a lot for his career. He was now more in demand. Other people would see his name on the board and be like, who's Phoenix Luna? I should see Phoenix Luna. That also meant that his rates bumped up as well. He's more in demand, he can charge more. But it was around this point in time when Yuka and Phoenix were closer than ever that things started to change between them. There was now a major power imbalance between the two of them. I mean, it had been gradually creeping up, I guess. From the point where they started seeing each other outside of the club, that power imbalance was very prevalent. Yuka was essentially paying him to be her boyfriend, but he wasn't her boyfriend, but he was being paid to act like her boyfriend and to care about her and the things that she had to say. Like, it's a very tricky dynamic. She was essentially paying all of his bills, paying, like, just paying to keep him alive um, and to be her boyfriend. And they spent so much time together. Like I said, nearly every single day they saw each other, both inside of work, outside of work. They were never apart. Well, apart from when they both had separate shifts at their own clubs. And Yuka would get very jealous and anxious over what Phoenix might be doing when she can't see him. Despite Yuka working the exact same job as him, let me remind you, they are both a host and a hostess. They both flirt with people for a job, yet she would get insanely jealous over the thought of him doing that, over the thought of him working his job. She was so worried that... Well, worried about him doing his job in general, but also I think there was an element of her being worried that one of these other women might strike up a deal with him, similar to what she had, where she was essentially paying him to be her boyfriend. So, Yuka starts checking Phoenix's phone. Every time they see each other, she's scrolling through his texts and his photos to see if he's in contact with other women. And I just want you to keep in mind for the rest of this video, I'm gonna stop saying it now, but they were not in a relationship. They never were. He never, like, gave her that feeling. She was paying for his time every time they saw each other, I think. But I think she started to forget that. They were never together. They never had rules on this relationship. Keep that in mind. But it got to a point where Yuka actually asked Phoenix to leave his job. She just couldn't handle it anymore, knowing that he was paid to flirt with other women. It made her so jealous. But Phoenix didn't leave. He kept his job and things just stayed (laughs) as they were. Nothing changed for him at any point during this. He liked Yuka, he liked the the situation that they had, the deal that they had. He had no problems with that. But things were changing very rapidly on Yuka's end. Day by day, she was becoming more and more unhealthily obsessed with Phoenix. Behind her very cute, sweet, innocent appearance, something much darker was When they were together, like physically together in the same room, Yuka was happy. She was calm, she was peaceful, she could see where he was, she could see who he was talking to. When she was in control, 
she was fine. But when they were apart and when she didn't have control over him or when she couldn't monitor him, she started to spiral. She would get so mad. She would get so upset, so anxious, so jealous. But Phoenix never really saw that side of her. That was always when she couldn't monitor him. So that was when she was in her club alone or in her house alone. He never saw that she was getting like that. She kept it hidden so well that she was like two different people. Whenever she would see Phoenix in person, she was that same good girl that he'd always thought she was. Then on May 23rd, 2019, so they've known each other about nine months at this point, Yuka invites Phoenix over to her apartment. She says that her place is a bit of a mess and she could do with some help tidying it. And I presume she was gonna pay for his time. So Phoenix said, okay, cool. He finished up at the club around midday that day. He was on a morning shift. So he said that he would be round to her house pretty much after his shift to help her. But work ended up running over a little bit and he didn't get to Yuka's apartment until about 3 p.m., which she was already a bit miffed by, but whatever. When he got there, he was exhausted. A hosting, a hostessing can be a tiring job. I mean, you've got to be really switched on. You've got to be aware of how you look, how you're coming across. Like it's a lot of like up and down going to get drinks and stuff. He was exhausted. So he said to Yuka, he was like, I will help you clean, but I'm gonna like try and have a bit of a rest first. So he went and ran a bath and he got in hoping that he could just freshen up and, and just have a bit of a chill and then he'd feel better. He actually fell asleep in the bath. <laughs> so he had this little nap and then he woke up and he realized that Yuka hadn't bothered him. She hadn't, you know, come to wake him up or anything. So he just presumed she didn't mind that he was resting. So he was like, okay, probably best to not fall asleep in the bath. So he gets out of the bath, puts on some boxes and then goes and gets into her bed to have like a proper nap. But not too long after drifting off, Phoenix suddenly awoke to a sharp pain in his abdomen. As he opened his eyes, he like tried to look around, but he was in a bit of a daze. He struggled to make out his surroundings. All he saw was Yuka sitting over him. The bed sheets were all stained in a dark red and there was a knife sticking out of his stomach. While he'd been sleeping, Yuka had been going through his phone again and she'd found some photos of him entertaining other clients at the club and it sent her over the edge. She became so consumed with her possessiveness, with her jealousy, that she wanted to hurt him. And there was also an element of, she didn't want him to live if she couldn't have him all to herself. The only way that she could ensure that the two of them would be together forever without anyone else interfering was for both of them to die. That was the only way she could get what she wanted. So while Phoenix lay in bed asleep, completely vulnerable, Yuka went to her kitchen, found the sharpest knife that she could and crept into the bedroom. She positioned herself on the bed, kind of sitting above him. And then she plunged the knife deep just once into his stomach. This singular stab wound instantly caused devastating, life-threatening damage to his organs. Straight after the impact, Phoenix wakes up and he's in this daze. He's trying to make sense of his surroundings. And when he does, when he realizes that she is trying to kill him, he goes into self-preservation mode. In a desperate attempt to stop the attack, to stop her from stabbing him a second time, he starts to tell Yuka that he loves her and he wants to be with her. He thought that was what she wanted to hear. He knew that she was a little bit jealous that she didn't like him working. Of course, she'd asked him to leave his job before. He knew that she loved him and this was probably why she was hurting him. He hoped that just telling her what he thought she wanted to hear would stop her, would calm her down. Phoenix knew that he wouldn't survive another stab wound like this. So when Yuka paused to take in his words when he was saying that he loved her, Phoenix took that opportunity to shove her off him. He threw her to the floor and stood up off of the bed with the knife still in his abdomen. And at this point, gravity pulls it down. It falls out of him. I'm imagining it did damage on the way out as well. And so now he was bleeding heavily. Whenever you remove a knife from a stab wound, that's when most of the blood loss happens. So, you know, just a side note, if touch wood, you ever find yourself stabbed, don't remove the knife. But despite all this pain and fear and, and blood loss, 
Phoenix managed to run away from Yuka, run out of the apartment. He got all the way to the elevator and was pressing the button. And at this point, Yuka comes out of her apartment. She starts racing down the hallway towards him. And luckily the doors of the elevator shut just in time. She didn't make it in there. He was losing massive amounts of blood. The lift was just covered in blood. The whole control panel where he pressed the button, everything was just covered in blood. He managed to get down to the lobby and he hoped that there would be someone down there that would see him and get help for him. But as he stumbled out of the elevator, Phoenix lost consciousness. He dropped to the floor in the entrance of the building. He's still bleeding so much. It's just covering the tiled floor. And right at that moment, Yuka catches back up to him. But what she did when she finally got to him again was quite surprising. She didn't try to hurt him again. She just sat down on the floor next to him. She simply got out a cigarette, lit it, and just started smoking it next to her dying victim. She just sat and watched as the man she loved was bleeding out on the floor. She knew that he was dying. She didn't try to get him any kind of help. This is what she wanted. She, she wanted him to die and she wanted to watch it. She even got out her phone at one point and just called one of her friends. She was just having a chat with her friend on the phone, smoking a cigarette next to Phoenix, who was bleeding out. Thankfully, not even 10 minutes after the attack, a passerby sees Phoenix, sees Yuka sitting next to him, just covered in his blood, and they call for the emergency services. During the time that he was laid bleeding before paramedics got there, no one had stepped in to try to help Phoenix, which is very sad. But when you think about the scene, it's quite understandable why nobody would want to get involved in that. From their perspective, there was a severely injured, dying man laying on the ground and it looked as though his killer was just sitting next to him, guarding the body. As I said, Yuka was completely covered in blood and she was eerily calm. It was quite obvious that she was the one that had done this to him and she didn't feel bad about it. If anything, she looked proud of what she'd done. Everyone that saw this scene just kept their distance, thinking that Yuka might still be armed and dangerous. When police did arrive, it took them a second to understand what they were seeing. I mean, two people covered in blood? It's understandable to think that they could both be victims. But Yuka's demeanor was just way too chilled. It was sinister. It was eerie. I mean, she was smoking a cigarette. She was way too calm. Too calm to have been a victim of an attack like this. She wasn't communicating with police. I mean, if she was a victim and then police arrived, you would, you would be like frantically trying to tell the story, would you not? So police figured out the situation pretty quickly and they decided that the best course of action would be to slowly and gently approach Yuka. They didn't want to spook her. They didn't want to trigger another attack. They, they didn't know what kind of state of mind she was in at this point in time, so they had to be very careful. Paramedics couldn't actually get near the victim, near Phoenix, until the suspect, Yuka, had been secured by police. So they were worried, actually, about how long it might take to detain Yuka. She might not be cooperative at all. But luckily for them, she went quite easily. She told them that she wasn't armed, she didn't resist arrest, she didn't resist anything. She was just put in the back of a police car and taken down to the station for questioning. And there, she told them everything. She didn't try to hide anything. She admitted that yes, she did try to kill Phoenix Luna, but she said it was actually intended to be a murder-suicide. She was gonna kill him and then wait for him to die. That's why she was just sitting by his body, smoking a cigarette, calling her friend, because she was waiting for him to be dead and then she said she was gonna kill herself. But back to the scene, once Yuka had been taken away, paramedics rushed over to see to Phoenix and they realized just how potentially fatal his injuries were. He was bleeding heavily. Yuka had stabbed right through his liver and because the knife wasn't in there anymore and because there'd probably been some sort of tearing as it fell out, he was bleeding at an insane rate. He was struggling to breathe, He'd already lost a lot of blood. He was very weak. He couldn't hold himself up, but he had a pulse. He was alive. So they rushed him to hospital as quickly as they could, hoping that they could save him. When he first arrived, doctors gave him just a 20% chance of survival. He was so critically injured 
that it was it was a miracle that he'd even survived long enough to get to the hospital. He was rushed into surgery where they tried to repair the massive wound in his abdomen, in his liver. He was given multiple blood transfusions as they were doing this. Luckily, they managed to salvage his liver, or they thought they had. I mean, it was gonna be a waiting game to see how his body reacted and recovered from this point, but the surgery seemed to be a success. And then for the next five days, Phoenix Luna was in a coma in intensive care. But as each day passed, he grew stronger. He was successfully recovering. Then on his fifth day in hospital, Phoenix awoke from his coma and he was finally able to talk to police and to tell them his version. Because I mean, they'd already spoken with Yuka and they'd already gotten a very strange tale from her. They asked her why she did this. And she said that she had tried to kill him because she loved him too much. She told the police that she herself had been suicidal for a while, but when she thought about taking her own life, she also wanted to take Phoenix with her. She never wanted to be without him. She didn't want to leave him here on this earth without her because then he would just see other women, I guess. She wanted to die and she wanted to take him with her. We have a translated quote here. She told the police, I thought I would kill him because I thought that was how I could be with him. I thought that expressions such as I like you and I would like to be with you would become a reality if we both die. She claimed that it was out of love or like maybe out of a fear of dying without him, but really it was out of jealousy and possession and delusion and abuse. Investigators had found a note in her phone where she'd like written a bit of a diary entry and she'd actually talked about killing Phoenix. It said, I want to be a tragic heroine. How is it possible for him to look at a woman other than me? I know killing him is for the best. If I kill him, it will be eternal and there will be no pain after. I don't need anything other than you. Going back to when Yuka was sat next to Phoenix as he was bleeding out on the floor of her apartment building, a passerby had actually managed to snap a photo of that. And I do just want to warn you, it is quite easily available online and it's very, very disturbing. I mean, she's covered in blood, it's gross. And I know that you guys sometimes like to do your own research alongside my videos, so I do just want to give you a warning. If you're going to Google this one, be careful. But when this passerby took this photo, they immediately posted it online. I mean, we're in, we're, it's 2019, of course, they're going to post it online. And it started going viral the same day. Which, I mean, people were morbidly curious and fascinated by this photo and, and the circumstances behind it or what might have been the circumstances behind it because at this point they didn't really know. But what no one could have expected was people liking the murderous woman in the photo, people becoming a fan of her. Yuka very quickly started to grow a fan base all surrounding this one photo of people saying that she was too beautiful to be a murderer. People made fan art of her, like covered in blood. People would say that they want her to attack them and like they could fix her and all this kind of shit. There's actually quite a common trope in like anime and manga called yandere, which is usually where a character will love another character so intensely and so obsessively that it turns them to violence, sometimes even murder. It's more often than not a young, beautiful character that is so head over heels in love for someone that it drives them to do insane shit. I mean, think Love from season two of You. She is very much a yandere. It is quite a popular trope in, in both anime and manga and even games. I think a lot of the fans of this particular trope are men that like the idea of a woman being obsessed with them to the point where it drives her to do mad shit. But then again, I mean, you don't have to be a man to be interested in fictional stories and fictional tropes, but I think that is where its main like fan base comes from, is men that like the idea of a woman being so digmatized by them that they go crazy. So as soon as these pictures of Yuka go viral and the story gets added behind it and everyone now knows that this girl covered in blood tried to kill her boyfriend or who she hoped would be her boyfriend because she was crazy for him, people started to call Yuka a real life yandere. And this story was circulating as if it was 
fictional. And people started to treat it as if it was fictional, forgetting that it's true crime. A man nearly lost his life. But people were treating it as if she was a manga character. Boys fancied her and thought that she was cool, a dream girl. Some girls even idolized her and said that she was so pretty and she, you know, did right. I just want to clarify that these are not normal people that think and talk like this. If you see a true crime case and you start to idolize the killer, go to therapy. These are like internet weirdos that we're talking about. This wasn't like a universal reaction to this case. These are just, you know, basement dwellers. But that being said, it was a big movement, like on Tumblr and everything. There was fan art. People were like drawing digital art of this girl covered in blood. It's, it's crazy. It's an insane. As Phoenix laid there in hospital recovering from a murder attempt, he's so anxious. He's in so much pain. He's still being tube fed. He's unable to eat. He can barely speak. As all of this is going on, his attempted murderer is being glorified on social media. All because she was pretty. All because she was pretty. People forget the heinous shit that she thought and did. They liked her because she was pretty. She was too beautiful to be a murderer. Yuka's own social media pages skyrocketed in followers. Loads of people were going back and finding her cosplay photos on Instagram, her TikTok of her doing like TikTok dances and her cosplay. People were sharing these around saying she was so beautiful, making fun out of these. Even though she had shamelessly admitted to trying to murder Phoenix Luna, people didn't care. She was, she was just beautiful. And so they started, like, they set up a GoFundMe page to cover her legal fees. Before it got shut down, it actually raised over £3,000. Who are these people? So the next few months, Phoenix spent just trying to recover. A lot of that was spent in the hospital. And then eventually when he was at home, he was on bed rest. He was full of anxiety. He, he had a lot to heal. Physical wounds mental trauma. But finally, after three months of recovery, Phoenix felt well enough to be able to return to the club and to work again. But he was gonna have to take things very easily. He didn't have the same abilities that he once had. I mean, because his liver had to be practically reconstructed, he couldn't really drink alcohol anymore, which he was a bit worried about because that's actually quite a, a big part of the host slash hostess jobs. I mean, your clients will order a round of drinks and then get you one if you're the pretty waiter. So he was a bit nervous about going back to work, but Club Fusion, his family that he worked with, really helped to look after him. They really helped to ease him back into things and for him to like customize his job, I guess, in a way that he could handle. And very soon after returning to the club, Phoenix was once again one of the top rated hosts. I think the virality of this case, the fact that he had survived a murder attempt made him kind of an attraction, like a sight to see at Club Fusion, you know, the boy who lived. Everyone had heard about him in the papers and seen his photos and knew that he worked at Club Fusion. So I guess people were just waiting for him to feel better so that they could go and see him. But that wasn't the only silver lining to come out of this case. It feels weird saying that, but I mean, I guess if you survived a murder attempt, you would be taking every benefit from it that you could. Another silver lining, I guess, is that Phoenix actually managed to reconnect with some of his siblings that he hadn't seen since he was six years old. Because when he was in that coma for five days, the hospital really didn't know whether he was gonna pull through, whether he was gonna survive. So they were desperately trying to find his next of kin, but of course, he hadn't been with his family since the age of six. It was very hard to track anyone down, but they'd managed it. They actually tracked down a few of his siblings. So now he had survived a murder attempt. His career was probably the best it had ever been. And he would found some of his family. He'd reconnected with his siblings. Oh, and by the way, Phoenix Luna isn't actually his real name. I don't think his real name is like online anywhere. Well, we couldn't find it, so. But hosts and hostesses usually give themselves a bit of a stage name or a nickname. And Phoenix came up with his after the attack. He decided to call himself Phoenix because he saw himself as a phoenix rising from the ashes. In mythology, a phoenix rising from the ashes symbolizes new beginnings and rebirth after total destruction and devastation. And 
Phoenix Luna really is the human embodiment of making something great out of the worst shit that could possibly ever happen to you. So in the run up to the trial, the attempted murder trial, Phoenix and Luna's legal teams had been discussing a financial settlement between the two parties. Yuka was agreeing to pay some level of financial compensation for what she'd done to Phoenix. And I think the main reason they were doing this was so that they could go to the actual trial and go, look, Yuka feels remorse. She's paid this amount of money to him because she feels bad for what she's done. And then maybe she would get a more lenient sentence. They reached an agreement that Yuka would pay him 5 million yen, which is about 28,000 pounds for trying to murder him. I mean, for me personally, there would be no amount of money that you could pay me where I would go, oh, don't worry, it's okay that you tried to kill me. But luckily for Yuka, Phoenix really didn't hold that much resentment towards her. He he had moved on in his own life and I think he wanted that for her as well. He wanted Yuka to be rehabilitated rather than just punished. And he himself actually asked the judge in the case to give her a lenient sentence because he didn't hold any ill will towards her anymore. In December 2019, Yuka Takayoka was found guilty of attempted murder. And I'm, I guess that's no surprise to anyone considering she admitted it. But despite that, she still burst into tears when the guilty verdict was read out. Like, what did you expect? A couple of days later, her sentencing was held and she was given three and a half years in prison for almost killing this man for no reason for no reason other than she was just greedy, jealous, and possessive. That's scary. To me, those are the kind of people that could well do this again, try to kill someone else again in the future. All it takes is for her to, you know, not be rehabilitated and then get into another relationship and get possessive and jealous again, and then someone else might die. But regardless, she was sentenced to three and a half years in prison. And since that was in December, 2019, she could be out any day now. She might even already be out. I don't know. We couldn't find it. And I guess a lot of the time they don't announce when someone has been let free from prison. So who knows? I think three and a half years is insane. But yeah, that is all I have for this case. Thank you so, so much for watching. And thanks again to Casetify for sponsoring this video. Remember, if you go to casetify.com forward slash Eleanor, you'll get 15% off of your order. It's automatically applied at checkout. So make sure you're ready for your iPhone 15, or if you already have it, I'm jealous. I didn't get one on the pre-order, but whatever. Thanks so much for watching this video. If you enjoyed, please leave a thumbs up or comment down below because the engagement really helps to push this video out to more people and I would be eternally grateful to you. If you wanna watch another video of mine, there should be one on screen right now, you can click that. Or if you wanna to subscribe to my channel, we post true crime content on here every single week. So click that little circle with my face in, make sure you subscribe, put your notifications on, and I'll see you next week. Bye.